I only make YouTube videos because it makes me so much money. Liar. Liar. I only make YouTube videos because the ladies tend to love them. Liar. Liar. Well, I only make YouTube videos because I love intelligent conversation on a variety of topics. Mm. Liar! I only make YouTube videos out of a crippling need for attention and to shout my opinions to the world. Bastard! Recently, I reviewed The Silver Blood Promise by James Logan, and while I enjoyed it, let's just say that it didn't quite satisfy my Lies of Loch Lamora craving like the marketing seemed to promise. In the following weeks, I knew that I would need to give Lies of Loch Lamora another reread to kind of scratch that itch. Um, and then serendipitously, uh, Gabe and I discovered that our friend Sam hadn't read the Gentleman Bastards series. So I did an episode with her, which premiered earlier this week. Uh, the link is in the description if you want to check that out. And during my reread for that episode, I couldn't help but notice how Lies of Locke Lamora just nails everything. It's one of the few books that I consider a perfect 10 out of 10, and it really excels in every category that I would typically critique something on. Now, the sequels, while I definitely enjoy them, the second book actually being my favorite in the entire series, certainly have their issues, um, especially that third book, but we don't really talk about that one too much, right? Okay. <laughs> but this first book really is a testimony to why I read fantasy. I want to lose myself in worlds and characters like these and to feel their triumphs and their setbacks. Lies of Loch Lamora isn't just a fun and witty book, it's a masterpiece. It captures the essence of what I think makes fantasy compelling, rich storytelling, memorable characters, and a world that feels alive. This video is a break from my recent videos where I rant about things that I don't like. <laughs> and today, I want to delve into why Lies of Locke Lamora is that masterpiece. I've also been thinking about making a video on single books that I consider perfect 10 out of 10s. So comment below if you're interested in that, and maybe I'll put that together sometime soon. For this video though, don't worry, I won't spoil any major plot points. I just want to go through some of the categories that I would normally critique a book on and try to show you what I see when I think of The Lies of Locke Lamora. With that, let's start where it all began with the author himself, Scott Lynch. What's really impressive about Lies of Locke Lamora is that it was Lynch's debut novel. Now, most authors don't hit it out of the park on their first try, but Lynch had been crafting stories for years even if he wasn't really publishing them. There's a somewhat recent interview that I watched a couple weeks ago that I'll link down in the description. You'll definitely want to check it out if you're interested in where he's at with the fourth book, as well as other cool little bits of information about Scott himself uh, that were pretty interesting to uh, learn about. He talks about DMing for Dungeons and Dragons games and writing stories for his friends to roleplay. And he also reveals that he rewrote the prologue for the first book dozens of times until it finally got to where it is today. His dedication paid off when a publisher took notice and asked what else he had. Lynch then crafted the first chapter in a single night, sealing the deal for Lies of Locke Lamora. What I think is really interesting is he talks about how he obsessively outlines and plans his books. He's not doing the pantser thing, uh, which works for some people and can definitely lead to a good story, but his meticulous planning really resonates with me and it shows me that he's thought ahead and you can see it pay off in incredibly cohesive storytelling, which is essential for tying everything together even as the plot twists and turns and unfolds into the story that we know and love.
So I won't recap the whole plot of the book, but if you're completely unaware, The Lies of Loch Lamora follows a group of thieves that grow up in the city of Camor, which is basically a fantasy version of Venice, Italy, and it's very, very cool. <laughs> uh, we're almost exclusively following the main POV of Loch Lamora as he goes from street urchin to joining the best thieving crew in the whole city. Not only are they robbing the nobility blind, but also pulling a fast one on the crime lord that oversees the different thieving crews across the city. This crime lord, Kappa Barsavi, has a rule against robbing the nobility and only allows them to steal from the merchant class. Now, throughout the book, we follow two timelines, one of a young Loch Lamora joining the Gentleman Bastard's thieving crew for the first time, as well as the adult timeline of Loch and the crew running a very intricate con on a member of the nobility and getting caught up in a web of deception and betrayal within the ranks of the thieving hierarchy. There's also a shadowy figure known as the Grey King that gets introduced that is basically our villain, and he's killing off the leaders of various gangs throughout the city of Camor, and Locke is a little worried that this new player will be coming for him next. So from here, I'm going to assume that you know a little about the book, even if you haven't read it. Uh, if you need more info about the story itself, I encourage you to either read it or check out a review like Murphy Napier's, which I'll link down in the description below. She did a fantastic job with her review on this book. But this, I, I kind of want to do more of a deep dive for this video. Again, it's not going to be spoilery, but I'm going to get into specifics of why this is such a great book. Um, but if you do need more of that story kind of explained to you, then there's definitely reviews that, that do that, certainly. Um, so first of all, what I love so much about the story is that it's not a straightforward con that the Gentleman Bastards are running on Don Salvara and his wife Sophia. There's a lot of moving pieces that you as the reader are not privy to until they're actually happening, and that's mostly true for the rest of the story as well. There's conversations and planning that happens behind the scenes that we're not really seeing right away until that part of the plan is shown rather than told to us later on. I'm a huge fan of show don't tell. <laughs> I often get frustrated when people say that this isn't a, a valid or necessary writing tool because in my opinion, it often comes off as writers excusing easy info dumps. Uh, but the large majority of this plot, world building, and characters is shown to us in action rather than info dumped to us. Now, there are some info dumps occasionally when we need a piece of world building that would otherwise be hard or maybe even impossible to communicate with how the story is set up, but it feels natural because the entire book feels like it is a narrator recounting a story directly to the reader. And, you know, people are going to comment and say, well, isn't that what every book is? And the answer is that it depends. Some books feel like the author just stuck a paragraph of world building on the page to save time and work, and others like this one feel like the author worked it into the narrative in a flowing and natural way. My point with all this is, the con that they are running is not told to you directly, all laid out only for you to watch them cross out objectives on their list as they go throughout the story. And it really feels like you are getting a peek into their lives for a brief amount of time and you are just watching everything unfold without a lot of the inside information that the gentleman bastards themselves are privy to. I also really love how Scott Lynch tends to do this thing throughout the trilogy where in the adult timeline alone, he'll have two different stories going on. Usually Locke and the gang dealing with two entirely different missions at the same time, and in this one it's the Don Salvara Khan and the Grey King storyline, and you as the reader never really expect those two storylines to have anything to do with each other, but 
by the end of the book, they blend together and mesh perfectly to where everything connects and it makes total sense why we were being shown these two stories that played out simultaneously. Similarly, he also always has two different timelines going in each of these books. The timelines always have you trying to decide which one you enjoy more, and they also connect to each other in really cool ways. There might be something that happens in the childhood timeline that will play a big part in the adult timeline many chapters later, or sometimes even in the immediate following chapter. And you know, Lots of books do this. I'm not going to pretend like it's wholly unique to this book, but what I can say is that this book does it significantly better than any other book I've seen try it. There are little tiny details that you don't pick up on on a first read, and only after reading a second or even a third time see the entire picture. These timelines and really just the story in general also provide for extremely satisfying character arcs. I always love seeing where the boys started out to then see them in the future where they've clearly grown beyond most of the problems of the past and are now dealing with new, more mature problems. <laughs> Lastly, one of the things I love most about the story and just the book in general is that it doesn't really use any well-worn tropes. People who review this book have said that it subverts common tropes and expectations. And I would say that maybe it subverts expectations because it definitely takes twists and turns that you wouldn't necessarily expect, but I really feel like it doesn't subvert any tropes, it more so just doesn't really use any, or maybe it creates its own, I don't really know. Like there's there's no subversion of like a farm boy to hero trope or anything like that. You might be able to make the argument for the like reluctant hero trope, but I would argue that Locke isn't really a hero, even with what he does at the very end of the book. I, I guess what I'm getting at here is that I don't think Lynch is making a point of turning tropes on their head. He's just writing characters who are stuck in the thick of it, and they really do feel wholly unique to this book and this world. The Gentleman Bastard's crew consists of Locke Lamora, who is kind of the mastermind behind all of their cons and plans, uh, John Tannen, who is the big, beefy, muscled bru bruiser, uh, but also is insanely smart with numbers and business practices. And then you have Callo and Galdo, who are two twins uh, that are good at disguises and playing roles, and are also kind of the jack-of-all-trades, masters-of-none type thieves. And lastly, you have Bug, who is the newest member of the crew. This tiny little teenager acts as their scout and distraction when they need him to do so. I love that they all have their specialties, and I feel like Scott Lynch uses this to great effect. I think that often it can be pretty tempting for authors to make their main characters a little overpowered and able to handle everything and not really needing people who specialize in certain skills. But for Locke Lamora, he straight up cannot fight or do math very well. He needs Jean in order to complete his cons, not to mention the other three uh, members of the crew. Locke is able to hone in on his particular task which is research and planning, and then delegate tasks to the other uh, members depending on what their particular skill set is. And I think Lynch does this really well because they have to learn how to rely on each other, which only strengthens their familial bond and forces them to learn to trust each other, which is a huge theme throughout all of these books. Speaking of which, Lynch does an amazing job at making the crew feel like genuine family. 
the bond between these boys is so strong. They bicker and banter like brothers that have spent way too much time together. Uh, but there's also moments where you can see that they truly love each other and would protect each other over everyone else. They go to extreme lengths to keep each other safe, including being willing to sacrifice themselves individually for the better safety of the others in the crew. And this continues to grow and become even more well-written in the next two books in the series. Just a quick aside, I love the fact that they don't steal for any real monetary reasons born out of greed. They're already insanely wealthy when we meet them, but they steal out of sheer love of the game. They have an addiction to it and they just love pissing off the nobility and trying their skill. It's just such a great plot point that I, I just I love about these characters. Because we meet other thieving crews and none of them are really doing what the gentlemen bastards are doing. A lot of them are just like basic sneak thieves or basic bruisers. None of them have the class that the gentlemen bastards have. Like Locke and his crew have something that is completely unique to all of the other thieving gangs in the city. Um, and it's just fun to follow them for that reason alone. So then we have Father Chains, who is the leader and mentor of the boys in the child timeline and is sadly deceased in the future timeline. Again, not a spoiler. This is something that you find out pretty much right away. Um, but what I love about him is that he takes in these scrappy little orphans and teaches them how to essentially live like the nobility. He's not exclusively teaching them how to run across roo rooftops and lurk in the shadows, and he's not cruel to them. He teaches them how to farm and count money properly and learn tons of languages and how to cook and serve high class meals all for the purpose of them impersonating the nobility in just about any country or region. They could honestly quit thieving altogether and get a very respectable job in a lucrative field <laughs> if they really wanted to, because uh, the education that they're getting with Father Chains is probably better than what a lot of the children in the nobility are getting. It's probably honestly leagues above what they're getting. He's also not domineering or demeaning. He doesn't lord over them in any other way than like a parent would. He treats them with respect and fairness and expects the same from them in return. He also shows kindness and understanding to them even when they don't deserve it, while also keeping a very strict and demanding schedule for their education. And it also helps that he's extremely funny with a very dry sense of humor that we'll see in just a bit um, that often peels layers of ego away <laughs> from these initially arrogant little boys. <laughs> The great thing about this story is that it's genuinely hard to figure out who the bad guys are. Because on the one hand, you could say that Father Chains is bad by teaching them how to steal and con people. But on the other hand, these orphans probably would have ended up on the noose if he hadn't taken them in. And he's also a source of kindness and security for these boys who are growing up in extremely rough circumstances. The same goes for, you know, Locke and, and the rest of the crew. Yes, they're thieves and they're con artists and bruisers, but you also see the deep sense of love and camaraderie that they have for each other and the respect that they have for Father Chains. And it's really hard to put them in that like bad guy category. Everything is so morally gray in this book in the best way. And I know that morally gray has become kind of this this buzzword uh, in recent years and like oh everything's morally gray but really i think this book does it maybe even the best that i've seen it maybe even better than something like night angel i think this book really is it's it's just really hard to 
tell who the bad guys are. Like even the main villain of the story is incredibly morally gray. Uh, he's definitely painted as the bad guy and takes things way too far, but you also get his backstory later on and see why he ended up this way. And all too often, I think an author will try to make a villain relatable, but it comes off as cheap and shallow. Whereas with the Grey King, you can actually like almost get behind what he's trying to do. And like you get so close to like understanding what he's about as you get further into the story. And it's so it's such a a perfect villain i i can't really talk about him that much because he is very spoilery if i get too far into into chatting about him um but he's definitely like one of my favorite villains like one of the most well-written villains that i've that i've read and when it comes to the city of kamor it really is just a city of people not good not bad just people trying to survive in whatever ways they have available to them and i really appreciate the way scott lynch handles this speaking of kamor as a city i love this city so much i feel like i can perfectly picture every scene throughout the book and envision it in such clarity not only is it loosely based on venice which i love i went there when i was younger and it was literally a fantasy land it was insane i would give anything to go back there <laughs> uh, but lynch does such an incredible job with the detail of the city where he gives you plenty to get your imagination racing, but also cuts it off before it becomes too bogged down with it all. I've definitely read books where it's just like constantly like description upon description upon description, and it can get to be too much. And I think this book just has the perfect amount. I'm gonna use the word perfect a lot in this video, I'm sorry, but it really is just the right amount to get your mind thinking and imagining things but not just not overstaying its welcome the city itself is full of these buildings made out of a substance known as elder glass which are remnants of an ancient civilization of incredibly powerful beings that constructed these huge like glass towers that are virtually indestructible and you know same as the description of the city with the the world building of these like this ancient civilization lynch gives you just enough info to like get you thinking about it and to theorize about it um but he also he's not giving you enough to fully understand it to fully like wrap your head around how powerful these these beings were or like even what they were or what they looked like or anything like that it's giving you just enough to you know think about it some more and it gives him as an author a lot of wiggle room to introduce new pieces of the magic and lore as time goes on and as future books come out hopefully um it it gives him a lot of space to to work with it and i can respect that for sure oh my back is killing me Jesus. We also get introduced to the order of the Bonds Mages. One thing I love about this series is that the magic is legitimately scary. Like it is not something that you can wrap your head around or understand, but it also doesn't feel like a soft magic system similar to like Lord of the Rings. It feels like there is a like rhyme and reason to it but just one that we haven't been shown the inner workings of yet the bonds mages have their own rules and history that is rich and dark and realistic and i love it any time that we are able to get even the smallest glimpse into how they work uh, they are essentially contracted magi and are completely loyal to the one holding their contract 
and they're also extremely expensive. They are cutthroat and ruthless and are completely outside the bounds of any governing body, which makes them terrifying. Absolutely terrifying because nobody can control them. Like nobody has any power over them and they essentially do whatever the person hiring them tells them to do, no matter how completely messed up it is. There's a lot of other really interesting world building that happens in the next two books, but that's a video for another day. <laughs> for now, I'll just say that Lynch did an incredible job thinking through all of the different social circles and politics of Kamor, and I just think it's a perfect example of world building done exactly right. So I have a couple final things that I don't have enough eloquent words to stretch them into their own category, uh, but one of them is the dialogue and the, the, so the dialogue and the banter in this book is by far better than any other book I've read right up there with King's Dark Tidings and the Dresden Files. This book makes me laugh out loud half the time and also makes me really think about life and various situations in a different light the other half of the time. For example, one of my favorite laugh out loud moments was this quote, while Locke and John are being played like fiddles to the tune of the Grey King who is trying to mess up their entire lives that they've worked so hard for. There's a few things that I want to ask the Grey King after all this is over. Philosophical questions like, how does it feel to be hung out a window by a rope tied around your balls, motherfucker? <laughs> God, I love that quote so much. It makes me laugh every single time. And I think that Scott Lynch also has a way of just stringing a number of expletives together and making it sound like complete poetry. Like seriously, some of the nastiest things I've read <laughs> are in this book, but I still sit there like, wow, he perfectly crafted that line of dialogue that must have taken forever. Like this one. Someday, Loch Lamora, someday you're gonna fuck up so magnificently so ambitiously, so overwhelmingly, that the sky will light up and the moons will spin and the gods themselves will shit comets with glee. And I just hope I'm still around to see it. Oh please, it'll never happen. Like, wow, you really get a certain vibe from that line of dialogue. And it fits so well with the rest of the story and the characters and the world building. It really is the cherry on top, the bow that ties it all together. And it is utter brilliance. During that podcast with Scott Lynch that I was referring to earlier, the interviewer asked Lynch how he comes up with all this brilliant dialogue. And he basically explained that it's similar to getting into an argument only to be sitting in your car or maybe your shower hours later and realize that you now have the perfect response to what the other person said. And obviously an author has the luxury to go back and rework any piece of dialogue they need to, which I think is what he was getting at. But on the flip side, every author has the same opportunity. It doesn't change the fact that Scott Lynch really has a way with words that just hits perfectly every time. I, I think he was just being a little humble and cheeky with that response, which I can definitely respect. The other thing that this book nails so well is just vibes. And I know, <laughs> I know that people hate this word and it may not be a foundational thing to judge a book on, but there's no arguing that while you're reading this book, you can just feel the vibes of the city and the characters and you feel like you can picture yourself on one of those quiet, lonely nights in Camor, sitting on a balcony in the Tower of Pelalandro, 
and just breathing in the sea air while Locke and the gang are gathered around a table with glasses of wine plotting their next con. And you can feel the heartbeat of a chase scene where the boys are running through the city of Kamor, either running from someone or chasing someone. You can feel the whimsy of the characters in their disguises and performing a role, captivating the person that they're running a con on. It's just such a rich and fully realized story all the pieces fitting perfectly together and complementing each other and working in unison like a well-oiled machine. I love this story so much because it reminds me why I read fantasy. I want to be swept off to another world and be drawn into a story that I don't want to pause. A story where I want to know the characters inside and out. I want to know everything about them and the world that they're in. And it is so, so incredibly rare for a story to captivate me like that nowadays. I don't even feel that way about some of my other favorite books. But this series will never fail to completely capture my heart and mind. And for that, I truly believe that this book is a masterpiece. Well done, Scott Lynch.